In 1984, owner Robert Ursay sought greener pastures for the colts. He found them in America's heartland. In Indianapolis, the Colts were greeted by a sparkling new stadium and fans hungry for professional football. In the beginning, it was disbelief. I, I've been a Colts fan since the late 50s. And somebody said, the Colts are coming to town. Said, yeah, right. The reception here was, was tremendous. I, I think um, I liken it to kind of the, the Beatles hitting America almost. 20,000 people showed up for a 45-minute pep rally. And the fans were just, they were just going nuts. You know, it seemed like downtown, the whole city just came out to, to show the support for the team and for the new owner. You would certainly think there are more important things in a city than a pro football team, but it is something that this city has longed for, and I believe that people wanted to show the rest of the country that Indianapolis is a viable community, and they want people to know that this is a moving community. And so we're beginning a new relationship. Uh, I think we're going through kind of the courting uh, procedure of the marriage, of a possible marriage, and I, I know that the marriage will be a, a good one. and. Uh, a profitable one for both uh, us and the people of the city of Indianapolis. It's a great city and great people here and we're going to win a lot of games for them. Colts fever ran high as the city embraced the organization. The move marked a new beginning. In their first regular season game at the Hoosier Dome, the team did their best to make a good first impression. But new locations couldn't solve old problems. And against the New York Jets, Indianapolis fumbled away the game. The 23-14 loss would be a harbinger of things to come for Indianapolis and its new team. Even during warm-ups, holding on to the ball was a trying task for the Colts. But on September 30th, 1984, running back Randy McMillan gained his grip and rushed for 114 yards and two touchdowns. His performance, along with that of safety Mark Defensis, helped the Colts post their first ever victory in Indianapolis, beating the Bills 31-17. But early on, wins were hard to come by. The Colts won just 12 games during their first three years in Indianapolis. It was tough getting off to the, to the start we did because the fans were so ready. And, um, and certainly they were forgiving early on because um, they were just so excited to have NFL football here and to be here. The early years were a struggle, no question about that. Good players, great games at times, but putting things together in consistency was what we didn't do. Frustrated fans often sought divine intervention, and sometimes their prayers were answered. Back to throw is Mike Pagel, rolls away from the pressure. He comes back right, looks down the field, he's looking for some help, throws it over the middle, and he's caught! It might be a touchdown! Oh, the immaculate reception! Sam Washington put it up in the air! Well, Pittsburgh pulled off the immaculate reception against Oakland. Today, it was Ray Butler. During the early years in Indianapolis, one of the few bright spots for the Colts was the play of linebacker Dwayne Bickett. The fifth overall selection in the 1985 draft, Bickett quickly made an impact. 
Dwayne was, was one of our outstanding defensive players and, and certainly was a leader and, and was a, a focal point of our team in the 80s. When you talk about Dwayne Bickett, in my opinion, you have a tremendous dichotomy. He's a killer underneath that exterior that looks kind of boyish. Hopefully he's the guy next door or marries my daughter. He is cold-blooded on that football field. Buddy, does he crank it up. Equally adept at playing the run and pass, he earned NFL Defensive Rookie of the Year honors in 1985 and solidified the Colts defense for the next eight years. Wideout Bill Brooks also paid instant dividends in his first year. Well, he came from Boston University. He came in as a fourth round draft choice and he played it right. He, he was a draft choice, but he understood he had to make the team. He played the game the way it was supposed to be played, hard on every down. Brooks set a Colt rookie receiving record with 1,131 yards. Uh, he made some great catches. He's a receiver that quarterbacks knew if you got the ball to him, he'd catch it somehow. He earned AFC Rookie of the Year honors and was a fixture on the Indianapolis offense from 1986 to 1992. Frustration hit an all-time high in 1986, when the Colts began the year with 13 straight losses. In need of a fresh start, Indianapolis turned to Ron Meyer. With the new coach came a new attitude. Get him down! There you go! There you go! That's what I hit it, baby! That's what I hit it! Was high. Ron brought a confidence to the team. Very early on in his first week here, he took the pressure off. Players relaxed a little bit. Meyer's positive outlook sparked the Colts to three consecutive victories as they closed out the year on a high note. But in order to sustain that success, the Colts needed a thoroughbred. They found one in Eric Dickerson. Playing with the Rams, Dickerson was the NFL's premier running back. In only four seasons, he amassed almost 7,000 yards. To the 45, to the 50, down to the 35, down to the 25, down to the 10, 5, touchdown, Eric Dickerson! Having coached him at SMU and needing to upgrade his team's talent level, Meyer prompted owner Robert Ursay to give up six draft picks plus two players in order to secure Dickerson's services. I was at home standing in the kitchen, in the kitchen, um, eating an ice cream sandwich, getting ready to go to a costume party. By that time, Coach Meyer called and he said, Eric, would you like to play for the Colts? I said, sure, Coach. Uh, I was very happy. Only at the last 11th hour did Eric have did it appear that we had a shot there and he was the only player in the league that we would have made this trade for. The deal, one of the biggest in NFL history, paid off immediately. Eric Dickerson came to town and immediately the Colts had a prestige they had not had before. That was, I, I think, something that was really significant for the franchise because we knew that we were giving up a lot, but it also signaled an aggressive attitude for, for the franchise, that we're going to go out and, and, and be aggressive and, and bring in, really, uh, one of the greatest running backs ever in his prime and the first star in Indianapolis. Dickerson rushed for over 1,000 yards in only nine games and was soon the favorite son of Indianapolis. Before a full house at the Hoosier Dome, number 29 put on one of his finest displays. He rushed for 196 yards, and the Colts captured their first AFC East title in 10 years. AFC East champions from last place to first. 
After enduring three consecutive losing seasons, Indianapolis finally had a winner. Who has quite honestly struggled for a few years, made the move here. <laughs> Happy just to be in the playoffs, the Colts went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Browns and matched them touchdown for touchdown in the first half. But in the end, the experienced Browns were too much for the upstart Colts. That was a really special year for us because it was the first taste Indianapolis got of winning. And, um, and certainly uh, it was something we'll remember and, and kind of signs of things to come. All the stars came out on Halloween night, 1988, as Monday Night Football came to Indianapolis for the first time. It was downright frightening the way Eric Dickerson dismantled the Denver Broncos defense. Dickerson scored a team record four times in the first half. Back is to Dickerson off the right side, trying to get outside of the 10. He's at the five, touchdown. And we'll give to Dickerson off the left side, cuts up the middle. 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown. Four of them tonight, four. He went on to become the first Colt since Alan Amici in 1955 to win the NFL rushing title. It was an incredible night for him and for the franchise, being back on Monday Night Football and the national spotlight. When you talk about this franchise with fans in this town, what's the best game? What was your biggest memory? I'd say six out of ten of them recall that Monday night game against Denver because of what it was, a Monday night game, a big win over a very good football team, and an offensive explosion like no one had seen. Since being spurned by John Elway in 1983, the Colts had five different starting quarterbacks. None of which could get a solid grip on the job. But in the 1990 draft, the Colts thought they had finally found their franchise quarterback in hometown hero, Jeff George. George showed flashes of brilliance in his first year, producing the most touchdown passes by a Colt quarterback in nine years. When you get a hometown hero in, I don't care who it is or what sport, fans expect what they saw in high school and college to take place in the NFL, and it doesn't always happen that way. The following year, the Colts set a record for offensive futility, and midway through a 1-15 season, Meyer was fired. Two years later, George was also shown the door. In need of a turnaround, the Colts reached into their past and hired former head coach Ted Marchabroda. I'm extremely delighted to return to the Colt organization because I, I always felt that uh, uh, once a Colt, always a Colt. It was a, a blast from the past, back from the 70s, and it was great to have Ted now coaching us in Indianapolis, and, and he was a trusted guy we turned to um, after a couple, couple tough years there. I think the thing about Ted is that he really unites a team and, and knows how to generate that team chemistry. He's a coach that players liked. He would go to bat for them. He liked them. When they needed to be chewed out, he did. That's the amazing thing. Ted is such a nice guy that you can't imagine Ted getting mad at, at, at the team. But he did when he had to. And they responded. They played well. Marcha Broda was just what the Colts needed. Led by a defense that featured first-round pick Steve Entman and Quentin Corriott, the Colts provided another of the NFL's great turnarounds as they went from 1-15 and 15 to 9-7. and seven.
Looking to boost their rushing attack, the Colts drafted running back Marshall Falk in 1994. The elusive Falk gained over 1,000 yards in four of his five seasons with the Colts. Falk was equally effective in the passing game. The run in 1995 to the AFC Championship game was incredible. The Colts found they always had a fighting chance when Jim Harbaugh took over as the team's starting quarterback. In the second game of the season against the Jets, we're down 24-3 at halftime. I sent Harbaugh in, and we ended up winning the ball game. Again, he jumps in the flat. And a month later, we're in Miami, and it's the same situation, although Jim was now starting 24 to 3 at halftime, and Jim brought us back, and uh, we won that game. Jimmy rolls out of it, throws on the run into the end zone. If they lose those games, the season could really have careened out of control to 4 and 12, what, who knows? But Harbaugh that year had something about him. Ted Marchavrota called him, you know, Captain Comeback. To keep finding answers and ways to win, the team really started believing in itself that there was no situation we couldn't overcome, nowhere we couldn't go in and have a decent shot at winning. The Colts are headed to the playoffs for the first time since 1987. We played 19 games that year, and 15 of them were decided by a touchdown or less. So they are a battle-tested ball club. The wild card Colts traveled to San Diego where they dominated the defending AFC champion Chargers. Crockett up the middle, Crockett's got running room, 30, he's at 25, 20, 10, 5, touchdown! Starting oh, the NFL. We ain't even supposed to be here, nobody wants us in the playoffs. They said it couldn't be done, baby. Here we go, Kansas City, one more time. The next week in frozen Kansas City, they knocked off the heavily favored Chiefs. throw Harbaugh out of the shotgun. He throws to the corner. Turner's got a touchdown. The Colts are going to the AFC Championship game. This has been one great season, and it's going on. They are now going to play Pittsburgh next Sunday in Pittsburgh. We go to San Diego. We're double-digit underdogs going to Kansas City double-digit underdogs and no chance of winning that game. And then going to Pittsburgh, again, double-digit underdogs. But our team was like, hey, you know, here we go again. We'll find a way to win. Don't know exactly how we're going to do it, but we will find a way. Everyone's just going to win it now. Expect Come on. to win it. You got to expect to win baby. Get it, baby. Get it, baby. One, two, three, win. Undaunted by the magnitude of the game, the Colts went after the Steelers. With just over eight minutes left, quarterback Jim Harbaugh connected with wideout Floyd Turner for a 47-yard scoring strike that put the Colts up 16 to 13. Suddenly, the Super Bowl seemed within reach. But the Colts let a chance for victory slip through their fingers. If you'd have caught that, we'd have won, we, we, would have, we would have won the game. Just on the sideline, you're thinking, gosh darn, you know, we got to make these plays. How do you drop that? I think maybe Mills may have got a hand on it. It's one of those, had he caught it, there'd be no question that Clinton would have been able to go all the way. And if he makes that, the game's over. The Steelers drove to the Colts' one-yard line, and they powered in for the score. Yet there's a minute and a half to go. Oh no, Jim Harbaugh's worked his magic before. Down 20 to 16 with just over a minute 30 left to play. Harbaugh felt right at home. He marched the Colts from their own 15 to the Steelers' 29. Come down to one play, see if they can pull it out. With a wing and a prayer, Harbaugh launched a pass into the end zone. 
Harbaugh out of the shotgun. Takes the snap. Drops the throw. Sets. He airs it out. Deep into the right-hand corner. Everybody in the end zone. They battle the ball. It is... No, they say incomplete. No, they say incomplete. No! The Colts thought they had it. They thought they had it. It's over. Aaron Bailey thought he had it in the end zone. The Steelers with a 20-16 win. Go to the Super Bowl, and the Colts go to a place in your heart. Boy, you're darn right. What an effort by the Colts, and they give it everything they had right down to the last play of this football game. This organization fought to the championship game and lost by inches. 1997 started on a sad note with the passing of owner Robert Ursay. On a taped interview, he was asked how much does he know about football. He said only enough to be dangerous. He wore his emotions on his sleeve. He did what some fans would like to do if they were an owner, which is emotionally will your team to victory any way you can. He really wanted to win um, as much as any owner, and sometimes the energy wasn't always um, aimed 100% in the right direction, but it wasn't because of the lack of desire and, um, and the passion to win. And I think as far as paying players and being aggressive like we were uh, since we've been in Indianapolis, basically, it reflected that. Deep down, he was still the fan, and um, I think sometimes for him it was overwhelming to really put into place that he was one of the 28 owners of an NFL team, and I think that showed a humble side, a humility side. Prior to his passing, Ursay was inducted into the Colts' ring of fame. I kind of go back to watching the Bears in the 60s and him and I being in the snow and the sleep and just being two fans, a father and son, and then to see him up in the stadium here in Indianapolis is kind of a great fitting way to epitomize what he meant to the city. His legacy is going to be bringing pro football to Indiana, and that's a great legacy to have and one that, you know, that I look forward to building off of. Assuming ownership of the team after his father's death, Jim Ursay saw that the Colts needed a makeover. He hired Bill Polian to oversee the football aspects of the club. Polian hired former New Orleans Saints head man Jim Mora as the team's coach. Next was a franchise quarterback. Who's your favorite football player, then? My dad. Your dad's your favorite football player, too? Well, you're on the right track. You're going to be a football player when you grow up? Mm-hmm. The son of former NFL quarterback Archie Manning, Peyton made his name known at the University of Tennessee. I think in this era now that exists in the NFL, you need a Peyton Manning and that cerebral approach more than ever. He's over 6'5", he's 230 pounds, he's got a good arm. There's no question his arm strength is above average. He can whip the ball around the field when he has to. Uh, and his accuracy is unbelievable. And his ability to read defense is, is incomparable. And I think all that's going to combine to make him a winning quarterback in the National Football League, somebody that can take you to a Super Bowl. Yours the first, baby! Hey, Manning, it's all us! With the uh, first pick of the draft, the Indianapolis Colts select quarterback, University of Tennessee, Peyton Manning. Taken with the first overall pick in the 1998 draft, Manning initially struggled Red with the nuances 12. of the pro game. Hut, hut. <laughs> no! That ain't right, is it? <laughs> Choke it a little bit. However, in his very first preseason game, Manning gave the NFL a glimpse of his potential. Against the Miami Dolphins on opening day, Manning felt the pressure of being a rookie quarterback in the NFL. <laughs> With just a few ticks on the clock, Manning threw the first touchdown pass of his career. It went to Marvin Harrison foreshadowing what would become the NFL's most productive passing combination. 
Manning came in here in 98, you could tell things were going to be better. You could see what was coming. Um, you knew how good he was going to be, and, um, and you knew it was probably going to be pretty quick. Number 18 eventually found his rhythm and became the most prolific rookie passer in NFL history. He set records for attempts, completions, yards, and touchdowns. Sets, looks, aims it deep, intended for Marvin Harrison. Marvin's got it! Touchdown! Marvin Harrison! With the uh, fourth choice in this draft, the Indianapolis Colts select Edgerin James, running back, University of Miami. The next year, Edger and James replaced Marshall Falk as the team's starting running back, and the offense didn't miss a beat. James was also a threat in the passing game. Fires it down the sideline, it's headed for Edgerin. He's got it! What a catch! Touchdown! The emergence of James, along with the growing chemistry between Manning and Harrison, made the Colts' offense one of the NFL's most versatile and lethal. Manning gives it answer, turns the corner at the 40, looks for a block, down to the 35, down to the 30, down to the 25, brings it back into the 20, down to the 15, down to the 10, down to the 5, touchdown! And John James! Manning threw for over 4,000 yards, 1,663 of which came courtesy of Harrison, who set a team record with 115 catches. James ended the year as the league's leading rusher, and all three were voted to the Pro Bowl as the Colts went from worst to first. Drops to throw, fires one over the middle, caught, touchdown! Touchdown! It is Marvin Harrison! The Colts are going to the playoffs as division champions. Put it on, put it on! Job, fellas. I mean, fabulous, fabulous. A 13-3 record earned the Colts their first division title since 1987, and Indianapolis the right to host its first ever NFL playoff game. It was incredible. It was it was an incredible build up to the game. You know, having a home playoff game, it, it was just really special. The atmosphere was tremendous. Excitement inside the RCA Dome was at a fever pitch as the Colts prepared to take on the Tennessee Titans. A home playoff game, the first one we'd had here. Fans were great. They were fired up all day long. It was a hard-hitting affair, with the Titans taking everything the Colts could dish out. He lost the ball! Picked up by the Colts! There's your turnover! Now let's go get him! Peyton Manning's heroics were not enough, as the future AFC champs defeated the Colts 19-16. to Losing at home was, was tough to them, but uh, it was a great year for us, and, and again, you know, when you go three and thirteen and thirteen and three, that's that's a bit of a turnaround. <laughs> um, but we could see it coming, and and the great thing we knew is this was just things to come. Um, that that we knew what type of team we had. We had a young team, and this was just the tip of the iceberg going forward. Expectations were high as the Colts entered 2001, but the offense was slowed by a season-ending knee injury to Edger and James. Edger James down on the sideline. That's the, the timeout right now, and that looks like a leg injury. Oh my goodness, you cannot have that. The loss of James, coupled with a porous defense, resulted in a 6-10 record, 
and the end of the Jim Mora era. Two thousand two became a year of change. They moved from the AFC East to the newly formed AFC South. In need of an upgrade on defense, the team turned to former Tampa Bay Buccaneer head coach Tony Dungy. It still is new and sounds uh, kind of funny in my ears, uh, head coach of the Indianapolis Colts. But it, it is very, very exciting. One of the reasons I was so aggressive in getting Tony Dungy was because we felt his system would be able to get this team up to snuff on defense pretty quick. Hey, we're up four, they got the ball, we got to slam the door on, right? And most of the time, it's a screw-up that gets you beat. If you don't screw up, they can't, they can't score. Dungy made defense a priority in the draft, as the Colts took defensive end Dwight Freeney in the first round. We went into the draft really looking for speed. Dwight Franey is a guy that had 31 sacks in his college career. We want him to bring that energy and suddenness to our defensive front and feel like he'll be able to do that. Franey turned out to be the impact player Dungy needed. As a rookie, he set a team record for sacks in a season with 13. However, the year belonged to Marvin Harrison. A first round draft choice in 1996, Harrison had long been regarded as one of the NFL's elite wideouts. For any young player coming in, you know, their eyes are always gonna be on the great players and, and, and the legends that have established themselves in this league. And with Marvin, you know, they're not going to hear a lot of chirping. They're just going to watch a lot of work. The plays you see on television and the, the, the catches he makes in games, those of us who go to practice see it every day. He practices like he plays. In 2002, Harrison set a new standard. He's now caught more passes than any other receiver in the history of the game in his first seven years. 632 career catches more than any other Colt. Marvin Harrison does it in his 102nd. He deserves more recognition. Pumps throws to the end zone. Marvin's got it! What a great catch! More touchdowns receiving than any Colts player in history, and that takes into consideration a gentleman by the name of Raymond Berry who's in the Hall of Fame. Against the Cleveland Browns in Week 15, Harrison set his sights on the NFL's single-season receiving record. You know where the Colts are going to go with the football. They're going to throw it to Marvin Harrison. Sometimes you just can't stop it. Looks, throws upfield. Marvin's got it. The 40. That's his 124th catch this year. He's caught more passes than any player in league history in a single season. Harrison then capped his record-setting day with a touchdown. Peyton takes the snap. Looks for Marvin. Sets. Here's it out down the corner. Looking for Marvin. And he ends up. Single freaking nine, nine. Single coverage. Screw all the posts. <laughs> Never move back. Just run the nine. At home in the season's final week, the Colts eyed their third trip to the playoffs in four years. Let's start the playoffs today now. Go, 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 baby. Looks to throw. Finish this season, 10 wins is something to be proud of. Winning like we did today, it's gonna put us on our way, man. Great job, good finish. Over the next two years, the Colts joined the NFL's elite. They posted back-to-back 12 and four records and earned a trip to the AFC title game. Down the middle, Stokely's got it, 
first playoff victory in Indianapolis, so we know this one's got to go to Jim Irsay. Right. But as good as the Colts were, the Patriots were better. Two years in a row, the Colts season ended in New England. Since his rookie year, Peyton Manning has been one of the NFL's best quarterbacks. As an owner, you just don't see a lot of Peytons. I mean, you know, you can stay in it for 30 or 40 years and maybe you get one. A two-time league MVP, Manning is the heart and soul of the Colts offense. His ability to read defenses is unparalleled and his accuracy is legendary. Peyton Manning wasn't a great athlete, wouldn't run a great 40, but if you watch his feet, he's got that innate feel in the pocket. Third and five from the 21, play action by Manning. Here we go. Newman balls his left-handed flip to Edger and James. First down. He feels pressure. He's got the clock in his head. He knows when to step in, step out. He knows when to get rid of the football. Manning fakes to Edger, looks. He's got Reggie Wade, the throw to Reggie. If you get a quarterback of his ilk who can stay upright long enough to find somebody, he's going to complete 65, 70% of his passes, and a lot of them are going to wind up in the end zone. Hey, new Mike to 52 over there. Manning has turned the audible into an art form. 96 double. Check out oh, what a flare, what a flare. His goal is not to get the, the perfect play, it's to get out of a bad play. And more times than not, they do that. He drops, looks, fires, touchdown, Reggie Wayne! It's a ballet that drives people crazy. You know, as you say, just snap the damn ball. They'll do it when they're damn well pleased. Check, check! One lap! One lap! Check, 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 check! One lap! One lap! Fifty spike! There are times when he calls a real play and then changes it. Uh, Japan! 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 There are times when he calls a phony play to extract a reaction before we call a real play. Then we have the fake play, real play, and then change the real play. Sally, 19! 19, Sally, 19! 19, Sally! Manning's pre-snap gyrations paid off in 2004 as he set the NFL record for touchdown passes with 49. It was the record that nobody thought would ever be broken. You know, you don't go into it thinking, well, I think we have a chance to throw 49 touchdown passes this year. Come on, be record, record, record. Snap is to Peyton. Protection stays in. He throws the Snowflake. That's, That's the record breaker. He broke it to Snowflake. Absolutely beautiful throw to Stokely yeah. right out of the break. Caught it on the run. And it's up for 49, and Dan Marino can take a step back. Peyton Manning can do it. The record they thought would never be broken has been broken. It was something to be part of, and it'll be interesting to see how long it stands, I'll tell you that much. The records kept coming for Manning. In 2005, he and Marvin Harrison became the most prolific passing tandem in NFL history as the team jetted out to a 13-0 start. But defense took center stage in 2005. The unit surrendered the fewest number of points in club history and ranked second in scoring defense. It's up by the post, and he's going to score 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown! We ain't leaving this field until we get one. We're going to bring it back. DBs, holla at me, baby! 
thanks to a suffocating defense, the Colts were able to exact a measure of revenge on the Patriots. Manning and Harrison then iced the victory. Takes the snap, sets, rolls to the right. The airs went out intended for Marvin Harrison. Touchdown, Marvin! His second of the game, and the Colts win it 40 to 21. The most points they've ever scored against New England. In the divisional round of the playoffs against the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Colts fell behind early, but their resolve would not waver. situation is bleak, but it's not done. 15 minutes left to play. 21-3. The Steelers have the lead. Payton takes the snap. Pump fake stays in. He throws one to Dallas at the 30-yard line. Cuts back in. Gets to the 25. Gets to the 20. 15. 10. 5. Touchdown, Dallas! A 50-yard throw. The Colts fight back. First and goal for the Colts. They give us Edgerton right up the middle. Edgerton dive. Touchdown! The Colts going for two. Manning takes the snap. Throws to the back of the end zone. Tony Dungy's defense stood tall in the face of adversity. And the handoff is to Jerome Bettis. Bettis pops the ball up. Oh, it's level. No, no. Picked up by Harper. He gets oh, it out to the 43-yard line. The Colts have a chance with a minute nine to go. They know They know Peyton Manning quickly drove the team towards overtime. Seconds left. 57,449 folks standing. Here comes Vanderjad. He's got to make a 45 yarder. He missed it badly. Oh, what can you say? It was a great year. 14 and 2. Great football game this afternoon. What a tremendous comeback in the fourth quarter. Now they fought right down to the very end. Though they fell just short of a championship in 2005 the Colts can look back on their march through time as one both turbulent and momentous. They are a team that has reflected the character of its surroundings. Proud, tough, and talented. And we can expect that the men with the horseshoe on their helmets will inspire the next generation of Colts to provide a future as rich as their past. <laughs>